that's a little different, as your pastor mentioned. I'm going to give a health message that really looks at a side of health that often is overlooked. But God has placed emphasis on it. So we are going to emphasize it in our study together this morning. Last night, we went over the principles of health and we began to look for Jesus. We began to look for him in sunshine. We, went, we looked for him in the trust experience. We looked for him in water. We looked for him in our nutrition. We looked for Jesus. And I don't know about you, but there's something that happens when you see him. I remember those men who had come from I believe it was, they were Gentiles, they had come from Greece, and they simply said this, we would see Jesus. They just wanted to see him. How do you feel about that today? Not too excited about it, I see. All right. All right, maybe we can, we can get them warmed up, and somehow, some way, that the people of God would be excited about seeing Jesus. You know, you desire, the whole reason why we spend so much time doing the things that we do as Christians is because ultimately, yes, the streets of gold are going to be nice. The pearly gates will be something to desire, yes, and it'll be a wonderful experience. The fact that the city itself sits upon 12 foundations of precious stones, that'll be enjoyable, I'm sure. The fact that, that there will be a tree of life, once again, the one that was taken out of the Garden of Eden, it'll show up again. We'll see it there, and it'll be on both sides of the river, and it will, the waters will be like the sea of glass. That will be nice. But the most important thing, that we'll see Jesus. That's going to be the thing. That's when we, the Bible tells us that we're going to take our crowns and we're going to cast them off and we're going to bow down and worship him because of what he has done for us. I'm looking forward to that day, are you? Amen. So our, our goal this entire weekend is to simply do that, to see Jesus. Yes, we'll talk about health. Yes, we'll talk about things of a nutrition uh, nature. We'll talk about the principles. But if we cannot see Jesus, it will all be in vain. And we'll just continue to go and do. Oh, my hope always when I come to a church is that there will be revival experienced. Revival. You know what revival means? That means that somewhere in your experience it was getting a little dead. It was starting to get a little routine. There was no excitement in your experience. You would come to church and it was just the same thing over and over and over again. And you're looking for something that will put a smile on your face again. I said a smile on your face again. <laughs> amen, amen. <laughs> this morning we're going to be covering the topic 10 steps ahead. Now you notice that I have 10 principles behind me and colorful banners, 10 principles, and they are trust more and stress less, have refreshing rest, enjoy sunshine, nutrition, exercise, water. You're all familiar with those. Living temperately, right? temperance, but there are two up here that you might not be as familiar with. Invest time in others and educate yourself. Now, you know about fresh air, but educate yourself. So these are the two that make up 10. And you would wonder, well, where did he get those from? Just went willy-nilly, got all excited and decided to add a few more principles to the health. Well, I wouldn't put them there unless they are found in the Word of God. And they are found in the book of Genesis. And I'd like to take you through those two principles, if I might, and help us to see a deeper side, a deeper side of our health message. Are you excited about that? I am. Let's have a word of prayer together. Father in heaven, we thank you so much for a good night's nice rest I personally had refreshing rest, and I pray that all the saints of God did as well. And Lord, our minds and our hearts are even more prepared today to be able to receive the things of God. But I humbly admit, Lord, that a man can't do it. We cannot do it, for the Bible tells us that it shall not be by might nor by power, but by my spirit, saith the Lord of hosts. 
and the anointing that we will receive will come and teach us. So, Lord, we claim the promise together that if we, being evil, know how to give good gifts to our children, how much more shall our Heavenly Father give the gift of the Holy Spirit to them that ask? And we are asking in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. You have your Bibles this morning. Now, for those of us, for those of us who have studied the Sabbath school lesson, I, I do want to apologize that we are going to depart from it, but not too far, because I understand that today's lesson, or this week's lesson, has been about the book of Revelation and seeing Jesus in the book of Revelation. And I love that word, revelation, root word being to reveal. And the book of Revelation, you know, it's always interesting to me. You'll find in a lot of churches, people don't read that book. They say it's scary. It's got the beasts in it and dragons and horned animals and all these kind of things. And it appears to be scary to some. But the Bible tells us right at the beginning of it that it is the revelation of Jesus Christ. It reveals him. It reveals who he is in our life. It reveals what he's done for us. It reveals what he's going to do for us. It reveals the fact that those who overcome, even as he overcame, will inherit all things. Wow. All things? Let me tell you what my mission is today. My goal is to have somebody just get so filled with goodness and the joy of God that they just say, hallelujah. It just comes out. You can't help it. You just say, hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. Right? That's my goal. Let's see how that works out. Amen. We got it started right over here. We got a hallelujah here. Sometimes we believe that it's, it's something that might be a little uncouth. To, I mean, I'm not asking anybody to be Pentecostal. You understand. I don't want anybody running up and down the aisles, flipping over the pews or anything like that. But the Bible encourages us as a health principle to be filled with thanks and gratitude. And believe it or not, it is a health principle. How many of you knew that? God knew it. Take, for example, take, for example, the Bible in Psalm, which book? The 107th division of Psalms. Turn there in your Bibles, if you will, along with me. And I want you to see something. I can quote it. You could probably quote it. But let's look at it and allow the spirit of the living God to teach us. Amen. And when you're there, we'll always stay together by you saying amen. And if you're not there, say have mercy. And we'll wait for you for a few moments or seconds. Psalm 107 begins with this. Oh, give thanks unto the Lord, for he is what? Some preachers like to say God is all the time and all the time God is good the Bible says oh give thanks unto the Lord for he is good why it answers for his mercies endure for how long for how long anybody happy about that today hallelujah you just got 10% healthier Listen, friends, when we are thankful to God, there is something that takes place physiological in our bodies. I am going to endeavor to, em, endeavor to prove that through this study. Now, notice something in verse 8. Can someone read that? Anyone courageous enough to read what it says in Psalm 107 and verse 8? Oh, if men would praise the Lord for his goodness and for his wonderful works to the children of men. It's almost like pleading with us. It's, it's like saying, please, oh, 
Oh, why don't you just stop it? When someone does that or says it that way, they're imploring you. Oh, give thanks unto the Lord, for he is good, for his mercy endures forever. Oh, if men would praise the Lord for his goodness and for his wonderful works to the children of men. What works has he done? Creation, beautiful, absolutely. What else? The victory of Calvary, the greatest work he's ever done. Calvary. Oh, if men would praise the Lord for Calvary. How he now even is up there interceding for you and I. Oh, if men would give thanks unto the Lord. I sense that the blood is coursing through your veins and moving up your spine, somewhere towards your mouth and wanting you to just say, thank you. Hallelujah. Oh, we're going somewhere with this. I, you know, I'll, I'll tell you like this. In any Sabbath school, whenever I do this, whenever I do this, I'm always happy when we start out right here. I'm always glad about it because I'm going to keep pressing and showing Jesus until it's uncontrollable. You know, when you go to churches, you're fine. This is my experience. I'm in a different church all the time, at least once or twice a month, different church somewhere in the world. And what I've noticed is that many people are pressing health, and they press it primarily through this channel. How you eat. Mmm. Yeah. Eat better. We'll be a healthier church. Or let's exercise. We'll be a healthier church. You know, sometimes we have little classes in the multi-purpose room, and, and we jump around and sweat and say, yeah, we're becoming a healthy church. Or drink more water. We're going to be a healthier church. Mm, yeah, yeah, that's what we'll do. And then, come Sabbath, I walk in at the healthy church that's eating a certain way and drinking plenty of water and exercising, and nobody seems happy. No one seems to have joy. No one seems to have peace. And I ask myself, how healthy is the church? Right? How healthy is the church? But the Bible says here, the psalmist is imploring us, oh, give thanks unto the Lord for his good. Oh, if men would praise the Lord for his goodness and his wonderful works to the children of men. Can, one, can someone read verse 15 for me, please? Let's see what that one says. Oh, that men would praise the Lord for his goodness and for his wonderful works to the children of men. Can someone read verse 21 for me? Just anyone. This is Sabbath school. Verse 21. Who's got it? So that men would praise the Lord for his goodness, for his wonderful works to the children. And why don't we read Psalm 107 and verse 31 together? Can we read it together? Oh, if men would praise the Lord for his goodness and for his wonderful works to the children of men. You know, Psalm 107 is almost a chronology as it takes people from how God has led them step by step out of bondage, out of the wilderness, through a better life. And he stops every so often and he says, don't you remember I did that for you? Oh, if you would praise the Lord for his goodness and for his wonderful works to the children of men. Has anyone had an experience with God where God has brought you out of something? Amen? I thought that, that we would be unanimous because we're all human. And humans do things and make decisions and make choices. It's been that way since the beginning of time. Things for which they need forgiveness. Things for which they need God to intercede. Things for which they need God to actually come and change and have mercy upon them. Unless we've come from some other planet. But you all look pretty human to me. So, with that said, oh, if we would only praise the Lord for his goodness and for his wonderful works to the children of men. Does anyone know what the first angel's message is? The first one. Yes, yes, yes. Fear God and give glory to him, for the hour of his judgment is come. And worship him who made heaven and earth and the sea 
and the fountains of waters. Now, why would you fear him? Why would you do all of that? Uh, because he's a creator? What does the first, that first angel, it describes him a certain way. He's got something. He's got the everlasting gospel. Now, you said he's got it. He's got it. Who is he? The angel? Well, you understand that the word there in Greek is angelos. Angelos, which simply means messenger or envoy or one sent by God. Are there any angeloses in this room? Any messengers in this room? Any messengers in this sanctuary? Perhaps over here. Any messengers? Absolutely, you beautiful messengers, you. You are messengers, which means that you have something with you. You have the everlasting gospel. What is the everlasting gospel? What is the everlasting gospel? Ah, that's a great answer. It is the good news. What is that good news? So the good news of the gospel is Jesus is coming again? Turn with me to 1 Corinthians and chapter 15 and verse 1. See, the, the reason why we might not have this thanks that is so that the Bible is imploring us to have readily have on our lips is because perhaps we haven't really thought about what the everlasting gospel is. And how does it affect your life? How is it affecting your life right now, today? Corinthians chapter 15 and verse 1. When everyone's there, when everyone is there, say amen. amen. Like a healthy church, amen. amen. Now here's Paul speaking. He says, here's our definition of the everlasting gospel. Here's our definition of the gospel. He says, moreover, brethren, I declare unto you what? The what? Which I preached unto you, which also ye have received, and wherein ye stand by which also ye are saved. If you keep in memory what I preached unto you, unless ye have believed in vain. Now who does that? For I, I delivered unto you first all that which I also received. What did you receive, Paul? How that Christ died for our sins, according to the scriptures. Here's the everlasting gospels. The everlasting gospel. And that he was buried and that he rose again the third day according to the scriptures. And then he was seen by everybody. So the gospel is and it's everlasting because when did Jesus decide to do that? Before the foundation of the world. He made the decision. In fact, it was a conversation that took place between the father and the son. They had a conversation. What if this amazing creation that you're about to create, what if they should happen to fall to that guy? What should happen if they are deceived and they sin? What if they become like him? What will we do? And there was a conversation. And we know from the spirit of prophecy that Jesus went unto him how many times? Three times he went, according to patriarchs and prophets, he went to the Father three times. I want to go down there for Rico. If Rico should fall, I want to go there for him and die. And the Father said, oh no, we've never been separated. And he left. But Jesus came back and said, if Ty should fall, I want to go back for her. And the father said, no again. And Jesus goes back a third time and pleads with the father. They had an agreement. They had a counsel. They had a conversation. Did you know that? And you don't have to go to the spirit of prophecy for it. Turn to Zechariah. Zechariah, the book of Zechariah, chapter 12.
turning to Zechariah. When I saw this, it really blew my mind. I love it when the Bible blows my mind. Are you that way? You ever have an experience in, with the Bible? And it so touches you that you just get up and you just have to run around the room? Anybody ever have that experience? No, just me? Hold on a second. I'm, 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 sometimes I have so many Bible texts in my head. I put them somewhere, and then I can't recall them. Is that old age? Okay, let me, let me pull it up for you. This is really going to really blow your mind when you see what I'm talking about here. This conversation that took place between them. Uh, yes. Zechariah 6.13, not 12. Zechariah 6.13. And when you're there, say amen. You are already very close. You're there? Amen. It says, even he shall build the temple. Uh, let me go back to 12. That's where I got the 12 in my mind. And speak unto him, saying, thus speaketh the Lord of hosts, saying, behold the man whose name is the branch. And he shall grow up out of his place, and he shall build the temple of the Lord. Even he shall build the temple of the Lord, and he shall bear the glory, and shall sit and rule upon his throne, and he shall be a priest unto his throne. And the council of peace shall be between them both. This is what the book patriarchs and prophets refers to when it says that he went into council with his father and had a conversation about us this is why the gospel is everlasting because it goes back to everlasting when the decision was made that Jesus would suffer die be buried and then raised up again for who for who do you know that when Jesus came, he referred to himself as the Son of Man? Do you know why he calls himself the Son of Man? Anybody know? Oh, I'm trying to speak to your heart today. He's called the Son of Man because the Bible says, the Bible tells us in John chapter 3 and verse 16, you know it, for God so loved the world that he... That's a big word. That means when he gave Jesus to us, he really gave him to us. He came through a woman and he became a man so that he could identify with me. So he refers to himself as the son of us. A brother, a friend, an everlasting father, right? When he ascends into heaven, he says, this son of man, he goes up into heaven. He goes up there not as the son of God, but as the son of man. So now he stands on the right hand of the father, not as the son of God, but as the son of man. The Bible tells us when the son of man returns, even when he comes back, he's not coming as the son of God. He's coming back as the son of man. He walked as one of us. He ascended as one of us. He's coming back as one of us. Pastor Jay, they're a tough crowd, man. They're a tough crowd. We're going to keep going and see if we can actually get somebody to say, oh, man, this Jesus, I want to know more about this Jesus. So God wants us to know that this in the everlasting gospel, this in the first angel's message, this is the thing that we are to fear, not because we're afraid, but because we're in awe. We're blown away by this. Why would God do this? Why, when the Bible tells us, Paul tells us in Romans, that while you were yet sinners, 
Now, I know some of you have never sinned, but the Bible says, while you were yet sinners, Christ died for you. I get so upset when I see Christians get upset when they actually make mistakes, when they fall. God, Jesus would have never come here if he thought that you would never mess up. He came here because you've messed up. Before you even knew you would mess up. There are no emergencies with him. He's never been, he's never been surprised by that one thing you've done. Now, I'm speaking about myself because I've done things and I have to say, oh, I'm, dis I'm disappointed, God. And he looks and says, am I not God? Did I not see you do that even before you did it? I had already decided that I was going to die for you. The Bible tells us in Isaiah 46, 9 and 10, he says, remember the former things of old, for I am God and there's none else. I am God and there's none like me, declaring the end, help me out, from the beginning and from ancient times, the things that are not yet done. He already knows us. God loves us, even when sometimes we don't act as if we, as if we love him. Now let me get back to the praise part of this. I'm hoping that praise is forming on your lips because the first angel message says, fear God and give, what's that word? Give what? Give what? Now turn to Psalms 50. Psalms 50 in the Bible. We're using our Bibles this weekend. I'm not saying that you don't normally, but I'm saying that well, I like to show what I'm talking about from the Scriptures because then you can say, wow, the Word of God really spoke to me, not that man did. Which division of the Psalms are we turning to? 50. Can someone read in this Sabbath school class Psalm 50 and verse 23? Psalm 50 and verse 23. Ah, stop right there. Can you read that first phrase again? Whoso offereth praise glorifieth me. So you quoted the first angel's message, which was fear God and give glory. So what is one of the ways that we give glory to God? What is one of the ways that we give glory to God under the first angel's message? Praise. By praising God, we glorify him. This is the first health message. Before we get anywhere else by actually giving glory or glorifying him through our praise. And again, I am not suggesting in any way that this has to be in the form of jumping around and kicking and scratching and yelling. Just a simple smile where under your breath you say or out of your mouth you say, Oh, thank God, for he is good. His mercy has endured forever in my life. Somebody might say amen. Maybe the lights will say amen. 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 Are you sufficiently warmed up? I barely have gotten into my message. I barely have gotten into our study. What time does Sabbath school go in this lovely church? What time do you go until? What time? 10? It's over already? 10.30? 10.30? Can I get 10.40? Over here, can I get 10.50? Oh, I like a church where you say, you know what? Let the Spirit lead. Or whatever the Sabbath school intendant says. All right, so we see here that God has always been 10 steps ahead of us. He's been 10 steps ahead of anything that we could think or imagine. Really, to be honest, he's been infinitely way ahead of us. But he gives us principles. Now, take, for instance, this principle, invest time in others, right? This is actually a health principle. God demonstrates it in the beginning in the book of Genesis because he invests time. God doesn't exist in time. When the two met and talked about us, as I mentioned there in Zechariah 6.13, when they met, there was no time. It was in eternity. That's where God exists. So the time factor is something unique to us. 
And when he said, son, in the sky, hold your place at the right spot, don't move. When he did that, God was setting time. And time benefits us. We benefit through the day by our going and being out in the sun and all of those things. And then at night, the sun sets and we get rest, right? This was for our benefit. Yeah? But it was an investment in time because the Bible tells us that Jesus would come in the cool of the day and he would come and spend time with his creation. That was his ideal. His perfect will is to spend time with his creation. That's the everlasting covenant, that he would be our God and we would be his people and that he would dwell with us. In fact, when we messed up in the wilderness, he said, let them make me a sanctuary that I may dwell with them. The angels must have said, but they are backbiting. They are backsliding. They are liars. They're murderers. They're sinners. They are liars. But God says, no, forget all of that. Put me in the middle of them. That's where I want to live. And if that's too obscure for you, John chapter 1 and verse 14 says, And the word was made flesh and lived with them, moved in with them, pitched his tent with them. Hallelujah. Oh, we're getting, I think, two of them. I got two that time. So God has invested time in us. And all the science shows us now, here's some of the science Modern science confirms that tangible assistance, tangible, tangible, things that you do, they're tangible. Tangible assistance to others protects our health and lengthens our lives. In this research, those who had helped others in some way previous, um, in a previous year had lower mortality rates. And when you get deeper into the study, it showed that when you actually gave and did things for other people, it actually increased your immune system. That's why the Bible says in Acts, it is better to than to, it's a health principle. It makes you feel good. And when you feel good, your body releases all types of wonderful hormones. May I do a social experiment at this juncture? I want everyone to take out a bill, a large bill, 20, 50, or 100. I want you to hold it up. I'm going to come through the audience. I'm going to collect them, and I want you to see how good you feel. No one likes social experiments anymore. <laughs> it's okay, but God has placed a system of giving within the church, not, because, not only because people out there need it or we need to have, you know, to keep up the bills and take care of the different expenses of the church, but because it is a systematic way of dealing with health that God has placed in us. When we give, we benefit from it. Because we're little, we're made in the image of God. And when God made us, he benefited from it. The Bible tells us after he had made man, he was ah, refreshed, is what Exodus tells us. Does that make sense to you? So investing time in others, that's all I'm going to spend there. But I'm going to skip along. I'm going to skip along that there was a leper. You remember that leper in Luke? There were, there were how many of lepers total? Well, the screen up there says it. There were 10 of them. And all 10 came to him. Anybody ever seen a leper? You've seen it with your own eyes. Leprosy right here in America. Amazing. It is amazing. One of the reasons is that we're seeing it is because people don't know our health message, and they'll eat things that might cause them to get sick including amadillo. Amadillos carry the virus that can cause leprosy. Did you know that? He, armadillos. He had himself an armadillo, and actually you can get the virus. So here is a real-life case of someone actually having armadillo. Right here in Panama City? I know it's big in Texas. Didn't know it was here. 
dead, alive, right arm, left arm, whatever it is, if you eat armadillo, they have, they carry the virus for leprosy. But this, there were 10 lepers, hold on a second, there were 10 lepers, and he cured all three, all 10 of them, right? And they walked away to show themselves to the priest, because the priest was doctor and priest, at the, at the synagogue, how many came back? How many came back? One. Just one came back. I want you to see why that one came back. And I want you to relate it to your experience. But let's keep going. I'm going to skip along here for the sake of time. Don't want to take up your whole Sabbath school, so I'm going to skip along here. Here in my presentation, it says that in the Savior's life were the principles of God's law. Simply this, what is the law? They had, Jesus had people come to him and say, what is the most important law? And he answers that question. He says, to love the Lord thy God with all your soul and all your might and all your strength, and to do what? And to love your neighbor as yourself. Friends, stop, pause, hard stop. Of all the laws, this is the most important. Why? Because Jesus says it is. Do you know what the worst sin is? If that's the most important law, if that's the best law, then what's the worst sin? Not loving God and not loving man. Just pause. Let that just speak to you for a moment. Because we're looking to do all these other things. But when it comes down to it, is simply, how much do you love God to the extent that you verbalize it, that you live it in your life, that you act it out, and then God says, forget about that. I'm not interested in that. Because I can see how much you love me when you love people. And if you don't love people, you don't love God. So what we need to do is to go back to square one and say, as I have, I really don't love you enough, Lord. Because sometimes I don't love people. That might be your experience. If you're honest, sometimes you don't. So God doesn't say, oh, how could you? He says, I know it already. So if you really don't love people enough, then you don't love God enough. And if you don't love God enough, you haven't really seen his love enough. If you see his love, experience his love, then guess what it happens? You start to love him. And when you start to love him, you can't help but love people. And he says, if you saying that you love me, whom you've never seen, but you come into church and you don't love your brother, whom you have seen, then the Bible says you're lying to yourself. Is that, is that the word of God? Have I spoken out of turn? See, I'd rather focus on, at the beginning of this, I'd rather focus on that as a health principle. Because that's where the rubber hits the road. I like what one pastor did up there in British Columbia. He said, listen to this. He said, and your pastor knows him, has experienced him. I just came from a urban ministries or mission to the cities conference. He asked the church members in a forum such as this, and he says, how healthy are we? And they say, we're very healthy. He says, if we closed the doors of this church tomorrow, never to open again. Would this community miss us? And it got quiet just like that. Because guess what was the answer that most of them realized? They wouldn't miss, aside from seeing people drive into the parking lot, on Sabbath. Now, I'm not saying about this church. I don't know. I don't know your business. You guys could be feeding the hungry. You could have Dorcas. You could have all these things going on, loving people all throughout Panama City. I don't know. So I'm not speaking to that. I'm just saying, in general, the church. 
as we deal with this one simple principle. How much do you appreciate the love of God to the extent that you love him, to the extent that you love people, and that it's tangible and seen of people to the extent that they say, if that church leaves tomorrow, we would be in a world of hurt. This is making sense. When God, when Jesus was here, his whole ministry combined this, this, this law perfectly. Two great commandments there. All right, let's get into this principle of educate yourself. All right, real fast. Then the Lord, here in Genesis 2.15, where? Genesis 2.15, then the Lord God took the man, and where did he put him? He put him in the garden to dress it and keep it. What's the difference between dressing and keeping? There is a difference. To dress something, maybe some of you have a nice garden. You are dressing it. You are making sure that you cut the weeds when they pop up, right? After a rain, you start to see those things. You're dressing it. But to keep it had a different meaning. They seem very similar, but God doesn't just repeat himself for no reason. When he does, there's an emphasis. But here, he's not repeating himself. There's something about that word keep. It is the word shamar in the Hebrew, shamar. And shamar means to observe. It means to observe, to look at, to study, right? To look at, to study. Adam, listen very carefully, was placed in the garden so that he would shamar, observe it. He'd watch. What do you think he was watching for? What was he observing? He was observing life. Any other takers? That's a good answer. He certainly was full of life. What was he observing? Surely you haven't. Is it Christine? He could see God. He could see God's. And it, the care that God had for him came out of what? Who said it back there? Love. He was observing the love of God. How do, do you remember any kids here? When your parent provides for you everything you need, what does that, what signal does that send to your heart and brain? He loves me. They love me. Every need that Adam and Eve had was met, and they were observing that in the things of the garden, right? So God said, go to the garden. Yes, there were no weeds, so he didn't have to deal with that, but there was some trimming, yeah, right? But the main thing was, he was to observe it, to see God's character revealed in nature. In fact, in the book, Steps to Christ, the very first sentence says that nature and revelation reveal the love of God. They both reveal the love of God. Here she's commenting on that. She says, to the dwellers in Eden were, was committed the care of the garden to dress it and keep it. Their occupation was not wearisome, but pleasant and invigorating. God appointed labor as a blessing to man to occupy his mind, to strengthen his body and to develop his faculties. Was that bell right there the 10 minute signal or at lunchtime? <laughs> Five minutes? You all misled me. You told me 10.30. I'm looking at the clock and it says 10, it's only 10.20. Okay, good, good, good. All right. So anyway, you come down here. I'm gonna skip along for the sake of time. It says here that when they were in the garden, every time they looked at the garden, it filled their hearts with deeper love and called for fresh expressions of, oh, give thanks. Oh, praise the Lord. So what the experience was in the garden was every time they looked around them, their hearts were filled with thanks, thanksgiving. Now look at the ministry of healing. It says nothing tends more to promote health of body and soul than does a spirit of what? That means you can't drink enough water that will cause you to be healthy or healthier than if you just said, thank you, Jesus. You cannot eat enough good, nutritious fruits and vegetables that's going to be better than saying, God, I'm so thankful for what you have done for me.
That's why the Bible says it's a good thing to give thanks unto the Lord and to sing praises unto his name. Now, that means something different now, doesn't it? It's healthy to do so. Educate yourself. Now, that's where you see this. Educate yourself. The principle is educate yourself to praise him. This is a great remedy for diseases of the... How many of you knew that? We've got just a couple minutes left. Can everyone stand? I want to show you something. I'm going to show you a real powerful health exercise. Just real quick. I want you to just stand up. Put your hand right here. And I want us to say hallelujah. Hallelujah. Do it again. Hallelujah. Where do you feel that? Do you feel it here? If you're doing it right, you should feel it right here. It's visceral. Ha. Le. Lu. Ya. Every single one of those syllables are concentrated right here where your immune system is strengthened by your gut bacteria. Ha. Le. Lu. Ya. I'm telling you, if you get up in the morning and did 20 of those, you could lose belly fat. Sit down. Sit down. You'll get a workout. By just praising God, it actually stimulates your immune system. You all don't believe me. Adults who frequently feel grateful have more energy, more optimism, more social connections, and more happiness than those who do not. Sleep more soundly, exercise more regularly, and have greater resistance to viral infections. Is that science? Agreeing with the Bible? You better believe it is. Okay, why 10 and not 8? According to the clock up there, I've got 6 minutes. And I'm going to 10.30. All right, there are 8 laws of health. Yes, we know that. 8 people populated the, the earth in Genesis. Now, I'm just showing you that numbers have significance in the Bible. And I'm showing you the difference between 8 and 10 in closing. Amen? And I'm going to come right back around to this whole idea of praising God and the leper. And close it all up. One nice package. By God's grace. Okay, so eight people, eight is the number for restoration and healing, and eight people repopulated the earth coincidentally in chapter eight of Genesis. That's a happy coincidence. The eighth man from Adam lived the longest. Eighth millennium, millennium is spent on earth restored, right? And vitamin K spikes on the eighth day. Why does that mean anything to anybody? Because vitamin K is the what kind of vitamin? Blood clotting. So when God said circumcise the child, not on the fifth day or the sixth day, but on the eighth day, God was recognizing that the number eight, number eight days, actually would be the best day to actually circumcise a child so that they would not bleed to death. See that? Okay, why 10? Well, Ellen White says that to indicate or to vindicate myself, my position or my mission, I would not utter 10 words. I would not seek to give evidence of my work. So in the Bible, the number 10 is for evidence or proof. I'm going to need sound on that microphone that I used. I think it was the blue one. I'm going to need sound in just about two minutes. Okay, let's look at the number 10, 10 commandments. God has come to prove you, he says in Exodus 20, 20. And if you love me, comes right back around. Then you keep my commandments. If you don't love me, don't do it. We see in the spirit of prophecy that the man who obeys because he's told to obey does not obey at all. If it is not motivated from the heart, it is not obedience. We do it because we love him and he loves us. The tithe is evidence of we trust God in our finances. Ten righteous in Sodom would have saved it because that would have been evidence that God had righteous people there. The shadow went back 10 degrees in 2 Kings chapter 20 and verse 10 and 11. Why? Because Hezekiah said, let the sun go back 10 degrees. That was evidence that God had heard him. Daniel asked to be proved 10 days and that he would be better using God's diet. And then the Bible says this. He was 10 times better than all of his companions. 10 plagues tested Egypt. It was evidence of God's power. Ten generations before the flood, ten generations after the flood. Probably is the most comprehensive study on longevity anywhere because we saw that before the flood, they lived 900 and some years, right? But then after the flood, 912 years they lived in the Bible. Methuselah living the longs at 969 years. 
But then after the flood, 317 years. 10 years before, 10 years after. It's evidence of what God says in his plan and how powerful that is. Yeah. The disciples waited in Jerusalem for 10 days. 40 days he was seen walking among, the, among men. And then they waited and it was 50 days Pentecost. So 10 days was evidence that the Holy Spirit had come down. Thank God for that. Hallelujah. Then there's that leper. Jesus heals the leper. Ten of them. How many came back? You agreed that it was one. How much is, what percentage is one out of ten? It was like a tithe. One came back and the Bible says that he fell down and he gave glory to God. First angel's message. Now, now here's a tip. If you really want to long... All right, I close on this. This is just Dan Buettner, who I talked about last night, who made popular the whole Blue Zone phenomena, or at least has identified it. I want you to listen very careful. Now, what does the number 10, what is that for? Proof or evidence. Proof or evidence. I want you to listen to what someone secular is saying about you. Okay? What someone secular is saying about us. And if it hits you in the right place, say hallelujah. Okay? Can we make that agreement in closing? Here we go. Now, here's a tip. If you really want a long and healthy life, it may help to live in a blue zone. That's the term given by the National Geographic fellow Dan Buechner. There's certain parts of the world where people are most likely to live to 100 years old or more. First of all, what is a blue zone exactly? It's a demographically confirmed, geographically defined area where people are living the longest. And we found five of them. We found one in Okinawa, Japan, longest of women on the planet, longest of men living in the highlands of Sardinia, uh, the Koya Peninsula of Costa Rica, Greece, and then the longest of Americans, right off the San Bernardino Freeway near Los Angeles, the Seventh day Adventists. And they're living about 10 years longer than their North American counterparts. <laughs> what? <laughs> I can't hear you. <laughs> Your evidence. You're evidence of God's love. You're evidence that you're God's people. You are evidence to the world that God is alive. Let us pray. Father in heaven, we thank you for the Sabbath school. We thank you that you have touched this people to live 10 years longer than the rest of the general population. Why? Because of your great love. You told the Israelites, you're not because, it's not because you were many, but because the Lord loved you. Father, may this place praise on our lips as we go through this day. Bless our service, we ask in Jesus' name. Amen. May God bless you.